Hi, I'm Todd Bernson. Welcome to this week's episode of The Pagan Voice. After listening to President Obama's inauguration speech, Amy Luna Mandarino decided to launch a petition to change the way that religious language was being used by the president. Amy is a San Francisco-based producer, choreographer, and music director who is joining us today to discuss her petition. Amy, welcome to the show. So tell us a bit about your petition. Well, I got the idea to start this petition after I was listening to President Obama's inauguration speech. Um, in his speech, I heard language that I found was really just inconsistent with what I know about President Obama. I, I believe that he's shown himself to be a man of conscience, of courage and inclusion. And also he's a brilliant constitutional law scholar. So I was just really puzzled by what seemed to be some inconsistencies in the language that he used in his inauguration speech and what the man that I know and the man that I voted for. Okay. What in particular did you notice that troubled you? Well, what particularly troubled me about his speech was in uh, referring to God as a man. He referred to God and his people. Um, he also referred to our Father's Creed, and um, he quoted the Declaration of Independence saying, all men are created equal. And uh, while I believe that you know his intent was to be inclusive, I don't think that language quite is inclusive. And he did say, and I quote, we are true to our creed when a little girl born into the bleakest poverty knows that she has the same chance to succeed as anybody else because she is an American, she is free, and she is equal, not just in the eyes of God, but also in our own. And my question is, how equal can that little girl feel in the eyes of a God that you have already identified as male? And I think, for example, this point becomes obvious. If our founders had said, for example, all whites are created equal, and he had asked his daughter to look into the eyes of God the white. I mean, that would just be really obvious that that would sort of compromise the ability of people of color to feel equal and free. And I'm simply saying the same argument. Um, when you refer to God as a man, you're not really representing all Americans because there are many Americans who have faith that um, consider, you know, the sacred feminine to be an important part of their beliefs. Um, that's the first part of the petition, that in referring to God as a man, you're excluding a lot of the faiths of a lot of Americans. And you're also excluding Americans who are agnostic or atheists. The second is that in referring to man, God as a man, that you're excluding um, the female gender. You know, over half the population is female. And so you're really kind of discounting the sacred feminine in a way that discriminates against women in our society. And the third point that I'm making in the petition is it's really a violation of the spirit of the First Amendment, uh, which states that, you know, Congress shall establish no law. Now, in the president speaking about God, he's not establishing a law, but he's giving the impression that the government is endorsing one particular faith, in particular a monotheistic male faith that, that, that honors a male god, um, over all the other faiths that are practiced in the country. And as I said, Obama, President Obama is a constitutional law scholar, and I would think that that would sort of violate his sense of constitutional ethics if that were pointed out to him. I think that brings up a very valid point. You don't necessarily have to pass a law in order to create the implication that a certain religious tradition has been endorsed and others are not. Very much so. And I also want to point out that while this petition is not appealing to a legal um, you know, precedent, we're not saying that President Obama is particularly violating any laws, but we are, I am, in writing the petition, I'm appealing to his humanity and I'm appealing to his sense of constitutional ethics. So what do you hope to accomplish here? Well, what I would like to do is have our country start to expand our dialogue about um, inclusion of religion and different religious beliefs. Uh, I'm not trying to exclude anyone's religious beliefs. I'm trying to include everyone's religious beliefs. I don't want to limit our concept of divinity. I want to expand our concept of divinity. And I think that that conversation is very overdue in our country. You know, I was an interfaith scholar as a young woman, and I discovered the sacred feminine at a very early age. So this has sort of been decades of me hearing our public discourse refer to God as a man. And so, you know, it's always sort of bothered me as American and citizen because I felt excluded. President Obama in his own speech said we need to bridge the meaning of such self-evident truths that we're all created equal with the realities of our time. 
time. And I think, again, you know, it's, this, is, this is the time. This is the moment. And I think President Obama is the man that will have the courage to take this step. Okay. How can people find more information about this petition? Well, what you need to do is go to the White House website. So that website is www.petitions.whitehouse.gov, G-O-V. And if you search under women's issues, the petition should come up. Well, Amy, I wish you the best of luck. It'll be interesting to hear how President Obama responds to your petition. As I was exploring what was happening around the world for this week's episode, I was struck by a couple of things. First, the amount of senseless violence against women in this world is staggering. Most people have heard about the medical student in India who was brutally attacked on a bus for two and a half hours and ended up dying in a hospital a couple of days later. In this incident, one of her attackers was a 17-year-old boy who was literally pulling her intestines out with his bare hands. In New Guinea this week, a 20-year-old mother of two was branded as a witch by her neighbors who then drug her out into the street, stripped her naked, and tortured her with red-hot irons until she confessed. She was then bound, doused with gasoline, and tossed onto a pile of burning tires in a garbage heap. As she lay there screaming while being burned alive, a crowd of onlookers sat around to watch and take pictures, including several school children. This week, a cultural minister in Kenya stated that more than 250 people have been killed for witchcraft over the past four years in one small region alone, and virtually all of them were women. There was another woman who was severely beaten this week by her neighbors in Nepal for being a witch. Her alleged crime was that during her work as a volunteer health worker, a woman in her community had a stillborn baby. And the list goes on and on. Reading these stories of horror day after day can be quite demoralizing. Just reflecting on what happened to that 20-year-old woman and how she must have felt when she was being burned alive by her neighbors made me sick. The question that this brought to mind was what cultural values are so prevalent in this world that it would make the dehumanization, torture, and senseless killing of women acceptable? Why does being born with ovaries rather than testes make someone so suspect, so less than human, that they are unworthy of being compensated for their work, are less respected, and seen as objects upon which society may vent its aggression? I suggest that a great deal of how we understand the nature of men and women comes from our collective religious heritage. If the mythology of men is that of purity and righteousness, and the mythology of women is that of temptress and being responsible for the fall of man, then at a very subconscious level, we will treat each of them very differently. I offer that the absurd amount of violence against women across the globe is ev evidence that at some level, women are seen as a threat and a source of pain and sorrow, or at least as being less important. We may not be consciously aware that we have these prejudices, but the evidence is pretty clear that they exist. The same prejudice against women does not exist in paganism. My hope is that by us bringing the pagan voice to the marketplace of ideas every week, that a more empowering mythology of women as creator, mother, and divine presence, presence may take hold. Blessed be. Hello everyone, I am Brianna Cruzan. Today I'm going to have a frank discussion of a subject that affects us all. That subject is sexual health and sexually transmitted infections. I'm joined by Christopher Sepio, a pagan herbalist and author of an ebook titled Making Peace with Herpes. He specializes in the treatment of sexually transmitted infections, and I would call him a healer of shame. Christopher, welcome to the show. Could you start by telling us about your background and your practice? I was uh, born in Trinidad in the Caribbean, and um, I was born into a family that had been herbalists for many generations. My uh, grandmother was an herbalist and Shango Baptist priest um, in Trinidad, and my great-grandmother was uh, a Carib Indian medicine woman in Guyana. And uh, even before them, you know, my family has been, I've been herbalist. So that's sort of the, uh, 
lineage that I was born into. But uh, I ended up um, getting herpes myself when I was uh, 25 years old, and uh, I had to learn how to treat it uh, for myself. And that took a while to figure out how to do it uh, effectively. Um, and um, I realized there were lots of people around me that, I, that were in my circle that were also suffering from it, and I started helping them, and it just sort of snowballed from there, and next thing I knew it, next thing I knew I was a full-time holistic viral specialist treating herpes and HPV and other sexually transmitted infections, which just sort of happened <laughs> in a blink of an eye kind of thing. Would you say that herpes is the most prevalent STI? No, but it's one of the more prevalent ones. Um, STDs are very prevalent. I mean, 80% of the population gets chlamydia, and most women get chlamydia more than once in their lifetime, whether they know it or not. 70% um, of the population is going to get HPV, the human papillomavirus, at one point or another in their, in their sexual history, whether they know it or not. Um, 60% of people are going to get type 1 or type 2 herpes or both in their sexual history, whether they know it or not. So those are sort of like the big three as far as um, prevalence. Um, but there's lots of other ones. I mean, there's 200 different sexually transmitted infections. So, um, yeah. So if people want to practice safer sex, what advice do you have for them? The reality is, no matter what anyone you know, tries to tell you, there's no such thing as risk-free sex. It just doesn't exist as a phenomenon. Whenever you have sex with someone, no matter what kind of sex it is, whether it's romantic sex with a you know, monogamous partner or going to an orgy, it doesn't really matter what kind of sex it is. Sex inherently has risk. It's a physically intimate act. It's the second most intimate thing you can do physically with your body. The only thing more intimate than having sex with someone or some people is for a woman to give birth to a baby. If a woman carries a baby for nine months and gives birth to that baby, that's the only thing that's more physically intimate than having sex with someone. So when you have sex with someone, you're exposing your whole microbiology to their whole microbiology. And, um, you know, and, you know, human human beings, 90% of your cells are viruses and bacteria and other microorganisms. Only 10% of your cells are human. So you're exposing each other to a lot of microbiology, uh, and that's just, you know, the way it is. And, uh, and so uh, sex is never risk-free physically, but it's never risk-free even emotionally or, or mentally. I mean, there's always a risk of getting used or, you know, getting toyed with or getting your heart broken or you know, whatever. So it, it's not risk-free on any level. You know, many people perceive there to be a stigma around having an STI. You know, to deal with stigma, it's just very simple, and that is don't accept it. Don't let anyone diss you. Don't let anyone stigmatize you. Be proud. Hold your head up high and realize that unless you buy into some sort of religious belief that you've been punished by God and, you know, and that's why you have an STD, if you want to believe that, go ahead. But if you don't buy into that, um, having an STD is no different uh, scientifically or biologically than having a cold or flu or having chickenpox or having any other infection. We get infections all the time. And not only do we get it, every single animal that has a backbone gets herpes. Cats get herpes, dogs get herpes, horses get herpes, elephants get herpes. I'm sure elephants are not you know, worrying about being stigmatized if they have herpes. Oh my God, they, you know, they're not going to want me in the elephant troop. What would you have to say to people who are trying to cope with dating and transmission? So, um, safer sex starts way before the sex. Uh, that's important, a very important point. Uh, if you want to practice safer sex, it has to happen way before there's ever sex. And the first thing that needs to happen with safer sex is there needs to be disclosure. Uh, people need to exchange information about what they've been tested for or not tested for, um, how many lovers they've had in their life, um, you know, the kinds of, um, the kinds of uh, prophylactic um, de 
devices that they are willing to use or not willing to use for safer sex so that people can have like a real understanding of what they're getting into or what they're walking into. So for example, if you're at a pagan festival or something and someone wants to get jiggy with you, um, they are an unknown to you and you are unknown to them. Um, so it doesn't take long to exchange that information, but there should be at least a two minute conversation uh, where you say to someone, uh, you know, this is my brief sexual history. Um, I regularly get tested for HIV. I'm HIV negative. Um, I, you know, I do have herpes. I've had it for 15 years. Um, I prefer using a condom. I also, you know, use an antiviral gel that I got from this crazy guy named Christopher. And, um, and I'm not looking to get pregnant. So, um, you know, definitely, you know, don't come inside of me, please. Um, and then you say, well, tell me, you know, or you also say, I've had approximately 50 lovers in my life. And then the other person would exchange the same information. And that way, you have an understanding of what the relative risk might be. So, for example, someone that's only had five lovers in their life is going to be a different kind of risk um, factor than someone that's had 250. And there's nothing wrong with having 250. It's just, you know, it's just something to, t to consider. The second part of safer sex, which again, that doesn't normally get discussed, is taking care of your health. <laughs> Someone that's eating properly, exercising, and taking appropriate uh, supplements uh, for, to help their immune system stay strong, is going to be a lower risk uh, for transmitting sexually transmitted infections than someone who isn't taking good care of themselves. So I'm curious, can people get oral herpes from sharing pipes or drinking glasses? Um, not so much. I mean, it's possible. Um, I think cutlery is yeah, cutlery is more of an issue. Um, so if you're having an oral, you know, herpes outbreak, you don't want to like, you know, um, you know, put a fork in your mouth with some cheesecake on, on in it, on it, and then pass that fork to uh, your loved one and say, "Hey, have some of this cheesecake." Uh, it's probably not something you want to do. You also want to be careful with like towels and washcloths. So uh, you would want to use separate towels and washcloths from other people uh, while you're still having the uh, outbreak, because wet towels can keep the virus alive, you know, for a while. Um, the virus doesn't live very long on on hard surfaces, um, but something like a towel um, can keep it alive a bit longer than a hard surface surface can. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I, you know, I don't want people to be afraid. Um, herpes is a very easy disease to treat um, naturally or, you know, or with, you know, pharmaceutical drugs. Um, so that's the good news. The good news is it's not some sort of devastating disease. It's difficult to treat. It's pretty easy to treat if you do the right things. And, um, and most STIs are the same. I mean... You know, HIV obviously is an exception, um, and HPV is a little bit of an exception, but most um, STIs are very easy and simple to, to treat, so we should not keep our heads in the sand because of fear, um, and there's absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing unnatural about having uh, an STI and, you know, you know, dinosaur fossils that are 140 million years old have been found with herpes sores on them, so... Uh, <laughs> there's, there's nothing unusual uh, going on here. This is life, and we just have to embrace what life is and respect life, and and just you know know what it's, know what it's all about. Now, if someone were to contact you for a consultation, what could they expect? Most of my patients tend to be women, about seventy percent, and most of them come to me because they want to make sure that they don't infect uh, their loved one or loved ones. And um, so I work with them and I help them change their diet if it needs changing and I help them uh, pick the right supplements to take and I make um, antiviral gel for them that they use uh, during sex to uh, reduce the risk and, um, and I also uh, make um, immune strengthening formulas to help them you know, keep their immune system strong. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Christopher. This has been one of the most amazing conversations that I have ever had. 
To everyone watching out there, this information is critical and under-discussed. Please share it with your friends and loved ones. Be safe, be informed, educate your children, and most importantly, embrace your sexuality without shame. More from The Pagan Voice in just a moment. Welcome, I'm Michelle Plug, and this is As We See It. During this part of the show, we will discuss a few topics that are impacting the world today. Today, we'll begin with discussing the files released to the public that revealed 12,000 pages of priests accused of sexual abuse towards children. Cardinal Roger Mahoney neglected to report the abusers to the police and instead reassigned them from one parish to another. By the time Cardinal Mahoney retired in 2011, the Los Angeles Archdiocese had dispersed $660 million in settlements amongst 500 victims. Now there has been talk of the diocese launching a fundraising campaign to raise $200 million to meet a variety of needs. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's pretty amazing. I you know, there, there are so many issues involved here. I mean, I think that there's, there's the, whole, um, the whole thing about the church covering up um, child abuse. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that in my mind is criminal. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you live, what status you have. If you're abusing children, you don't, you don't need, deserve to be protected. You know, I, I think that that needs to be called out. And the fact that, and the fact that the, the parents were, you know, had these kids involved in the church thinking that this was a safe haven for them, I think is just an, an enormous betrayal of trust. I think it's real scary. Yeah. I, I agree. And, you know, I don't, I don't understand, you know, in reading some of Mahoney's statements about, well, I was never taught how to deal with this kind of situation, la, la, la. How can you not know that child molestation is wrong? Right. There, there, it's, it's, it, it, it makes me so angry, I, I'm like almost speechless. And if you don't know that child molestation is wrong, you have no business being in a position of authority. I agree, in, with in a completely, completely. Well, and that's part of it too, is looking at it from a standpoint and his excuses are just benign, right? Like they're just silly because the fact of the matter is it doesn't take a genius to figure out that that's a problem and that people should not have to put their children in a situation where they can't trust their spiritual leader. My other thing with this was what, where's the legal ramifications? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what they're looking at right now is figuring out well, what do we do with this from a legal position? Because it, personally, I think that Mahoney and anyone that's in these documents that have been released deserve to be charged with the crimes they've committed. I found it really interesting that there have been so many people who have been involved in in the Catholic Church who um, are just running to the defense and donating tons of money and all of this. And <clears throat> while in some respect I, I understand supporting your you know your spiritual community, totally get that. But there's almost this lack of of wanting to hold those who have done these kinds of things accountable. It, it's like there's this deep denial about reality. And one of the questions that I, I was pondering was why why is this so prevalent in in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. in the first place? Why is it? Because I mean, we just had a huge thing in 2002 over the same issue, and this guy's career is like 30 years. So this has been ongoing even since before this started to get media attention. Why is it happening? And I personally think that you know the 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 vow of celibacy that these people take. Okay, if if anyone has any kind of issue with their own sexuality, they're like, oh, well, I'm going to enter into a position where sex is taken off the table. So they think they themselves are safe, but then they're put in a position of power where they have access and temptation. And I really just feel that there's just a huge level of denial around the reality of what's going on here. And I just. I would just pray that they would bring their own light of God to shine mm -hmm. on this situation. You know, there's no reason to protect people who have committed these kinds of crimes. And you would have a better image with the public if you tarred and feathered these people than trying to cover it up. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the things with um, repressing sexuality and looking at things <sighs> to consenting adults of the same sex wanting to have sex with one another, right? That's means to go to hell, right? 
in that thought process and that belief system, but molesting children by the person bringing down the word of God in their belief system is to be covered up. And it makes absolutely no sense. Well, <clears throat> and just understanding the psychology of humans, right, is that any natural impulse that can't find a healthy outlet will find an unhealthy one. Yep. And sexuality is so much a core of who we are. And ever since, you know, when we're a kid, I mean, from very earliest days, you know, are you a boy or a girl? And, you know, kind of understanding some of those differences and how we see ourselves as masculine, feminine, who we're attracted to, all of those are wrapped up in our sexuality. And when... Um, when sexuality is uh, is such a, a taboo thing, and sexuality, uh, sexual behavior is so tightly conscript, conscripted, in in a lot of respects, it it, it really um, subverts the natural, you know, a very natural mm -hmm. part of being a human being. And and I think that, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the consequences of that are being seen in the church. Yeah, and it's funny to me, I come from a half of my family's Catholic, and I see the mentality, and so much of it is blind following. And, you know, thank goodness my parents aren't that way, but <laughs> so I got a little bit of a different perspective. But I've seen the blind following, and who's donating money to this cause to rebuild from the settlements that have been handed out to the victims of these priests? I mean, who's donating money to that? And it's people that aren't thinking for themselves. The thing that really bothers me the most out of this whole thing, I mean, yes, there's there's the Catholic Church that's all been a violation of trust. It it all of those kids, yeah, who have been, um, you know, who have really not only had their personal safety shaken, have been traumatized, and don't know, you know, have no sense of, you know, who can I trust? Where am I safe? And yes. that that part I've it is the yeah, most it, that that in this it's just evil. To, to just completely disregard what they have done to these children and this, the, the internal scars these kids will take with them through the rest of their lives because of what these priests have done. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's it, uh, I'm gonna, am I gonna use the right word here? No, I'm not, I can't quite get it to come forward. <laughs> it's terrible, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing. And I just, I really wish that they would wake up and change some of their policies and the way that they do things and change the psychology, the rehabilitation to the children and the victims rather than these priests. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that they don't need help too, but. Is reprehensible? Is that it? Did I say it right? Yes. There we go. There we go. So, a Washington state lawmaker has put forth the plan to sell naming rights to publicly owned facilities. Republican State Representative Jan Angel says she is trying to think outside the box to generate revenue without demanding more from taxpayers. Other states have instated these policies and found them to be financially rewarding. But many people are skeptical as to how much the purchasers involved will influence the people in the government. Um. This is a, a bit of a hot button topic for me mm -hmm. uh, uh, because um, it is becoming more and more difficult to try to find any place in our society where you can go that's outside of commercial influence. And these you know, buildings such as libraries, schools, um, community pools, I mean, these are things that, uh, that are for the people, by the people. They are built by the community. They are for the community. And, uh, and the, the fact that there have been a few very wealthy people who have uh, worked extremely hard to cut the tax base to such, to such a point where cities and states now don't have the means to even support their own community infrastructure um, has resulted now in corporations coming in and saying, okay, well now we can have the Nickelodeon prison. You know, now we can have, you know, now this, this library will, will be the, the twixt library. And what that does is, it, in, in a sense, it's kind of like all of this resource that has been built by the community is being usurped for commercialism. And I, I, I really find that troubling. I'm wondering who's at the Nickelodeon prison. Yeah. <laughs> Maxima, maximum security. Maximum security. Yeah. security. Bonnie, probably. Nickelodeon prison. Bonnie gets a DWI, goes to Nickelodeon prison. Sorry. I, I, I have mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, I don't want to see all of our public uh, and community works bought up by private interest. I think that that's asking for a lot of trouble. 
on the other hand, you know, if we're at a crisis point when it comes to our finances and the only way for these programs to continue is to be funded by, you know, a corporate source, then we have to seriously, you know, take that into consideration. And what I'm wondering is, is that when they think, when they consider these sorts of changes in legislature about what can and cannot be bought, what sort of, uh, uh, p uh, parameters are they putting out as far as like you know you what's okay and what's not okay for the 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 company coming in to because you know, you're talking about naming rights well what else what other rights do they have when what what can't they do you know that would be my my question I mean this comes um, this is part of a, a larger campaign I mean there there are also you know schools that don't have the funding to get technology in the classrooms and They'll be approached by, um, you know, by a candy manufacturer that says, you know what, we'll put in televisions and, uh, and give you all kinds of media resources as long as you play commercials for our products in the classroom. And it's like, mm -hmm. their kids are there to learn. You know, I mean, is there no place that is sacred that, that can, uh, we can avoid being sold? Right. You know, is there no place where we can avoid, you know, kind of the commercial culture that is, that's part of America? The manipulation marketing. Absolutely. That's what it is. And they've proven so much about sci child psychology that the things that we're most drawn to, like the smell of baby powder, like we all love that smell because we smelt it when we were infants, you know. So we're, we get, you know, triggered on those certain things. So it would just be another thing right. that is brainwashing us. <gasps> oh. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more from the Pagan Voice. Parents are generally thought to educate and protect their children of the dangers of drugs. But how often are parents the ones delivering the product? 37-year-old Rebecca Rochelle Hill pleaded guilty to giving her 12-year-old daughter heroin. After Hill was arrested for shoplifting at the Mall of America, her daughter was put back in the care of her father. The following day, the father brought the 12-year-old girl to the hospital as she was suffering through withdrawals. The daughter is now going through treatment. What do you guys think about that story? Because it blows my mind. I, I guess I feel like when we have all these conversations about child molestation and gun violence and how messed up everything is, I guess I'm not surprised that there's someone who is messed up to the point where they're giving their children uh, drugs. I, I, I don't even know where to begin with this. Well, and I think it would be different if... Uh, I mean, there's some parents that will let their kids have a have a beer at home or a glass of wine with the rest of the family or things like that, um, I, and I think that that's that's a little bit of a different thing than giving your child heroin. Yeah, yeah you know. Yeah, and that's it's like I I just wonder you know kind of where in that whole thought process that the idea of doing that just kind of seemed to be a really good one. I wonder if it's the psych. This is going to sound maybe wackadoo, but I wonder if it's the psychology of passing down like what you're doing to your mm -hmm. kids. Like there's not a, a, a checkpoint of your own mor moral standards because that's something you do. So why wouldn't it be okay for my kid? Maybe sure. there's no. Well, and I you know um, and also sometimes in, in addiction, it's it's like if somebody around you is not doing what you're doing, it it mm -hmm. kind of highlights. Your own um, your own illness, and so you know maybe in, in some you know in some way the mom was trying to help herself feel better. Where you know well if the daughter is is using drugs with me, then we're kind of together on this, and I don't feel you know it doesn't highlight my own illness. You're looking at me, and again, I've got nothing. I, <laughs> I, I don't I don't even know what to say. I I, I read the story, and I I'm like, you know. I've known people throughout my life that have been in different social strata, shall we say, okay? And there are, you know, people who, yeah, what the story didn't cover was what the mom's life is like. You know, does she have a, does, is she an addict herself? Does she have a history of mental illness? What's her income level? Is she working at all? Is she on welfare? Like, what is, are they living in the projects? I mean, what, what's, what's, her, deal? what's her deal? Exactly. I mean, they, don't, they didn't really talk about that. And if you're in a situation where you're in poverty and whatever checks you get from the government every month, you're spending mo mostly on drugs and whatever you can get from, you know, the food shelf. I mean, 
I, I feel like this person is is in a bad way, and they're passing on that that mentality and that way of life onto their kid. I mean, we we kids get mentalities and ways of life from the time that they're born. You know, so 12 seems like a really young age to give anyone heroin, and yes, we can all say that's completely wrong, but we don't know anything else about what this woman's life is like that led to her to, to do this with her daughter. I, you know, I, I think you bring up a very good point, um, and it, it is really easy just to demonize somebody, say, you know, boy, look at what they did, aren't they bad? You know, we're so much better than that. You know, but the reality is, is that, uh, and as you bring up, we, we don't know what her situation is. Right. I mean, sometimes when people are under extreme circumstances, they do things that, that kind of defy reason. Exactly. And, and, and anybody in those circum, you know, in, in really tough circumstances is going to make some choices that they wouldn't necessarily be proud of. And unfortunately, other people become their victims mm -hmm. because that's clearly what happened here is that she was... Um, but it's abuse, that's child abuse, right. to give Definitely. your kids drugs, and it's heroin. It's not like it's something that she could, I guess she could sprinkle it on cupcakes, but at the same time, it's something that she was you know, either injecting or ingesting in some way. Um, and I do, I've been around a lot of addiction and I've had addicts in my life, and it is something where they're not, mm -hmm. it's a selfish disease. Addiction mm -hmm. is a very selfish thing, and there's not a thought process around how you're affecting other people around you. Um, that being said, one of the things about drugs is you, sh I just think it's the same thing of the right to choose if you're going to do them or not. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, heroin, you know, is a terrible drug and it leads to a lot of issues in a lot of people's lives. But even as that 12 year old girl, she should get to choose if she's going to go use or not. It shouldn't be something inflicted on her by her parents. But on the other hand, if we've had conversations about things like sex trafficking, where these kids are, you know, put in a situation mm -hmm. where we ask, why are they choosing to be prostitutes? I don't necessarily think that someone at the age of 12 has the full mental capacity to, co to consider the ramifications of their actions. You know, yes, I think that, you know, we talk about free will, but it's like if you hit a certain certain level, certain age, where it's like, okay, yes, that's a bad choice, but you're an adult now, and if that's the choice you want to make, that's on you. But at, at 12, I just, I can't, I can't agree with any kind of mentality that she has any, you know, I agree with you on that any, any real awareness of what her actions are doing to her, her body, and her life. I was coming from the standpoint that it wasn't her choice to use those drugs, that her mom was giving them to her for whatever reason. Sure. I think that if somebody's going to use drugs, they should have a choice as an adult to sure. make that decision, not be a 12-year-old kid and have your parent giving them to you. Right. Right. So right. I completely were on the same wavelength with that 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think that you're, um, you know, one of the points that you made was, you know, about addiction being a selfish disease and how... Um, when you're in the throes of, of addiction, how um, the world just is in a very distorted mm -hmm. place. And, uh, and, and I, I, I mean, I've been in recovery now for, for many, many years. Um, but, you know, very early in my life, I was in that place too. You know, I mean, I lived in an abandoned house and did drugs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know that being in that, in that place, there, it's, it's like, I remember f I just feeling surprised that people actually had jobs, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it seems yeah. crazy to, to say it now, but you know, when you're in that, when you're in the throes of addiction, your, your mind just gets so twisted that, that it, it's like your behavior and all of that just becomes very distorted. And I think that this is just an example of what's going on with her. And unfortunately, this 12 year old girl paid the consequences. Absolutely, and hopefully the mom gets treatment and gets right. the help right. she needs and she Absolutely. can rebuild. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the process. Yeah. So, every year for the past seven years, the Don't Say Gay bill has failed to be passed in Tennessee. Although the phrasing is vague, some of the verbiage in the bill can be interpreted as an obligation for teachers and social workers to out children grades K through 8 to their parents if there is speculation of homosexuality. Although it can be argued that the bill in no way says this, the bill's leader, Senator Stacey Campfield, has made many homophobic remarks that have led citizens to assume the worst. Campfield is quoted as saying to TMZ in an interview on February 1st in regards to the LGBT community, quit trying to ram it down everybody's throats and quit pushing it on everyone. Just leave us alone. 
One of the myths that's out there, I, I think, in, uh, among many people, is that somehow there's this agenda to recruit people to being gay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and it just... Well, sign me up. <laughs> right? I mean, it, just, it, it just doesn't happen that way. No. no. You know, uh, it's... We're, you're born with an orientation, you know, and, uh, and that either needs to be respected or not. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't, I, this whole idea that, you know, if, if a child even asks you anything that could be on the subject of, of being ho, uh, homosexual, then you have to report it to their parents. I'm like, it's creepy. It, it just, it's like when they start talking about banning books or, you know, you can't just ban a certain kind of language from from kids who are developing, they don't even have a sense of themselves yet, or they're and they're trying to figure out who they are, and they need to be in a supportive environment that can help educate them, not deny their the reality of their thought process or what they're feeling or whatever. And then then what are they going to do? They're going to grow up to become priests and molest children. I'm sorry. Did I <laughs> you went there. I'm sorry. You did. I did go there. The repressed sexuality. Uh, well, I'm gonna talking come about sideways. repressed sexuality, you know, and that's what they're doing. You know, that's that's what this environment would create is well, it's also assuming that kids that are us you know, in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade are not sexual already. And we're finding that kids are having sex as young as 11, 12 years old because the education isn't there, right? right. Like they're, and they're not finding the healthy ways to choose and be able to say yes or no to what they want and what they don't want and experience sexuality from a place of decision and choice rather than a place of just, I have no idea what I'm doing because nobody's educated me and right. here we go. Right, right. Well, you know, um, this also creates a, 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 a a sense of non-safety around Absolutely. around just simple questions about sexuality, right. and um, if you know, I, I would I would venture that most of the people in the schools would be sophisticated enough um, to you know, if a kid was asking about what it means to be gay, that they could give a fairly thoughtful answer. Yeah. Um, the problem is if there are people who are um, who are zealots. You know, for a particular agenda, you know, for the anti-gay agenda or whatever that, you know, whatever that is, that, um, you know, this could turn into a, a place where kids are no longer safe to even ask some of the most rudimentary questions mm -hmm. around sexuality without mm -hmm. somehow being labeled as, you know, being in, in, in crisis or in trouble in some way. Absolutely. And then at what point, then where do they go? If there's no safety to just be curious, mm -hmm. and this isn't saying like, it's, it's be like I'm 12 years old and I want to ask the question of what is homosexuality and suddenly it's like oh well we're gonna tell your parents you're a lesbian now like that's not fair like it's, it should be something on the table to be discussed not something to be pushed down and then all of a sudden creating a label out of right. Right. yeah all right well that's it for today from as we see it we'll see you in a little bit more from the pagan voice Matthew Jeffers is a 21-year-old student at Towson University that inspired the Baltimore Ravens football team through a heartfelt piece of fan mail. Head coach Harbaugh was so moved by the email that he immediately forwarded it to the entire team. I too was undeniably inspired by Matthew's letter and want to share part of it with you because that's the beauty of inspiration. We want to spread it everywhere. His letter reads, and let me let you in on a little secret. Life doesn't care about streaks. It does not care about three game losing streaks or four game win streaks. It does not care if you want to win, if you need to win. At the end of the day, life is simply unfair. I am short statured. I am 21 years old, but stand only four foot two. Over my lifetime, I have endured 20 surgeries, some small, others life threatening. I have had a trichotomy. I have had blood transfusions. I have spent summers in a hip spica cast and have had to learn how to walk again. My last surgery was in 2003 and I acquired the naive mindset that I was free from the bondage of heartache. I had the mindset that I had done my time. And then in February of 2011, my mother was diagnosed with a stage five brain tumor. As I write this, the doctors at JHU are determining whether or not the next step should be hospice care. So you tell me, is life fair? 
when you give every ounce you have and all you have to show for it is a loss in overtime, is that fair? When families in Newtown, Connecticut go into their child's room but have no child to kiss goodnight, is that fair? We live in a painful world, no doubt about it. But let me tell you this, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. The only disability in life is a bad attitude. A positive attitude is the most powerful combatant for life's misfortune. The will to fight, to survive, to win. It is the secret weapon I use and I think I'm turning out okay. When you play on Sunday, let it not be to win a division or to silence the critics or prove somebody wrong or end a losing skid. Let it be a dedication to that simple yet powerful notion that life can be conquered with the right outlook. And I promise you, I promise you that everything else will take care of itself. Matthew. The Ravens went on to win the Super Bowl this season, and I like to think that Matthew's powerful words had something to do with that. You can find the full letter, commentary, and more information about Matthew Jeffers at thebaltimoreravens.com. More next from the Pagan Voice. Hi, and welcome back. Um, I would like to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about what's been going on here behind the scenes at, at the Pagan Voice. Uh, we, this has really been an, an interesting time for us because we have, been, uh, we have been getting on some television stations around the country. We have been experiencing an awful lot of growth. And with that growth has been uh, a few challenges. And uh, today we thought we'd just take this, this moment to chat with you a little bit about what, uh, what's been going on. Uh, one of the things that you've probably noticed is that a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had an episode that was not on the air. Uh, the reason why this was not on the air is that we ran into some technological issues that, uh, that meant that we just didn't have a show. So one of the things that we are trying to do is, is remedy that. And uh, so what I would like to do is just kind of open it up to talk a little bit about what's been going on at the Pagan Voice and, and uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do. Well, I think that one thing that's been so exciting for me being a part of the show is the impact we've been having on people mm -hmm. and the viewers and the community that's being built not only within the pagan community, but outside of the pagan community of people that just love the show are being inspired by it. We're touching hearts, you know, lives are getting excited. Everybody's getting excited about it. And I think that that's what we're doing here. That's what we're about. You know, the number one comment that I get from my guests, the ones that have come on the show, are thank you for taking an interest in this topic. You know, there's a lot of stories out there that people just don't, aren't aware of, they don't know about, they, it never occurred to them that something was going on. And I really feel I know, honored that I get to be a part of a, a, a program and a movement and, a, and whatever that, that looks at some of these topics and brings them to light, you know? And we get, we get so many emails from people all over the world. I mean, we've had uh, emails from as far away as Israel, Great Britain, just about every continent, except for Antarctica, um, and every state in the U.S. We get emails every day talking about um, how much this show has resonated with people and how much, uh, I, get, I get an email from one woman who, um, whose husband was in the military when we, did that, when we did that story on military suicides. She talks about how much of an influence that was and how much she appreciated that. Um, you know, topics about uh, the heathenry, uh, the interview that we did, uh, or that you did, uh, about heathenry and how, uh, how well recepted, you know, um, uh, received that has been and, and how much people appreciate that. You know, one of the challenges, though, is that, you know, up to this point, we've all been volunteers and yeah. we've been working with equipment that has been essentially begged, borrowed, and stolen um, as, as, you know, as much as we could. And, uh, and I think that with what we've had, we've been able to do a lot of amazing things. But, uh, but moving forward, it's going to be important for us to, you know, to, to really step up and, and have our own space. Well, you know, I hear, I, I hear people say your show has a lot of potential. And I'm like, okay, 
the reason we're not maybe growing as fast or meeting as much potential as we could as quickly as we could is because we're volunteers. All of us, everyone on this crew is volunteering their time to put this show together. And I think what we've come up with so far is amazing. What, that we've been able to come together and, and produce what we've been able to produce is fantastic. But in order to go to the next level, in order to continue this work that we're doing, we really need some help from the community. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say too, I think that something that I hope is not lost on our viewers is we're all here for really similar purposes because we all believe in radical acceptance, love and connection. And that's really the foundation of the show. We bring a different perspective, a pagan perspective. We're speaking through that languaging in a lot of ways, but that's the common belief that binds us. Mm -hmm. For me, for me, I've been. I think of paganism as a culture of tolerance. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're looking to. Um, create a platform in which everyone is allowed to express themselves in their individual way as best as possible and be supported and know that they are loved, honored, and accepted for who they are no matter what that expression is. Well, I hope that you are finding that our show to be helpful and valuable um, because we're doing this for you. Uh, all of us work long hours and, uh, and spend a, a great deal of effort to bring this to you every week. And we want to take this show to the next level. And, uh, and so I, I, I would go out to our website, take a look at everything that we are doing to, uh, to improve this show and, uh, and create a, a new studio so that we can have a, a better quality program for you. And I wanna thank you very much for joining us all today. And uh, till next week, this is The Pagan Voice. <laughs>